This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 116. As companies create personalized interactions for their customers, and as they implement new technologies like chatbots and voice assistants, they are discovering that they need new business practices to manage these experiences. One of the most powerful ways to organize and structure the content that drives these new interactions is an ontology. Seth Early can help you understand what an ontology is and how it can help your company's content efforts. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 116 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Seth Early. Seth is the founder and CEO of Seth, um, of, I'm sorry, of Seth, of Early Information Science, uh, an information uh, architecture and other kind of consultancy. So welcome, Seth. Tell the folks a little bit more about what you do there at your consultancy. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So <clears throat> we've been around for 20 plus years, 25 plus years. Uh, I don't want to date myself too badly, but I've uh, been around for a long time. I started when I was 12. So just, just you know, this just the 30 years in business doesn't scare you. <laughs> the math checks out. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I like to say, uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm much long, younger in base 12, whatever my age is. So <laughs> well, uh, it, it goes along with another joke, but that's okay. We'll skip that. But uh, I've been around for uh, quite a while. I've been working with Fortune 1000 companies over the years. We have about 50 consultants, and everything we do is about information, making it more findable, usable, and valuable. And that includes doing things like working with large uh, product catalogs and e-commerce sites. It uh, entails work around knowledge management knowledge architecture, knowledge engineering, it entails work around content operations, especially componentized content and content reuse. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. It, uh, it, it entails pretty much uh, <clears throat> the range of things that you would do with content and data and information and making it more accessible uh, to people and, and applicable to whatever problem you're trying to solve. Nice. And I think that's a swath of information that's of great interest to my listeners. Um, one thing, uh, you wrote a book recently, it's called, uh, look at the title, The AI Powered Enterprise. Uh, and the, the key to that is, um, you, oh, there, th thank you. <laughs> yeah. Anybody I'll, not I'll, just listening if they're watching. <clears throat> yeah, no, well, there will be a video, <clears throat> so folks will get to see that. I'll also put a link to the book in the chat. But I, the, the, the first couple of chapters of that book, you talk about, well, first, like just the benefits of, of these kinds of technologies. Mm -hmm. But the second chapter, you talk about ontology. And that's what I really would like mm -hmm. to focus the conversation sure. on today, because that's such a powerful organizing scheme for, for modern mm -hmm. information. Can you just describe for our folks sure. what an ontology is? Sure. Yeah. So an ontology describes domain of knowledge. So if you're in life sciences or pharmaceuticals, it consists of multiple taxonomies. So everybody's familiar with taxonomy and controlled vocabulary. Well, you know, you might have a list of chemical compounds and you have another list of generic names <clears throat> of compounds and maybe another list of, uh, of uh, brand names and uh, commercial names. Well, maybe they're all this representing the same thing. So they're actually non-preferred terms. You're building a thesaurus structure. The thesaurus structure, uh, because you have preferred terms, non-preferred terms, uh, and so on, and uh, alternate terms, temp chemical terms, uh, brand names, etc. But then you also have things like mechanisms of action. Um, you have drug targets. <clears throat> you have uh, diseases, uh, indications, treatments. Uh, you have everything from you know for a life sciences firm. It's also going to include you know go to market strategies and regions in which they work and uh, key opinion leaders and, you know, pack practitioner specialists. So all of these vocabularies, all these organizing principles, all the buckets in which you would put information, you never create a single taxonomy. We always create multiple taxonomies when we're doing in any kind of information architecture or data strategy. And uh, essentially what that means is the multiple taxonomies <clears throat> with the relationships between them, because again, you can have a thesaurus structure that says, here's a preferred term and a non-preferred term. Those are synonym relationships. But you can also have a related term. You can say it's kind of the see also term. So you could have um, 
you know, you could have uh, diseases and uh, indications for those diseases. You can have uh, diseases and treatments, right? Treatments for those diseases. You can have drug targets and mechanisms of action. And it's the relationships between those. Here's the mechanism of action assigned with this drug target, which is related to this generic compound, which is related <clears throat> to this brand compound. And <clears throat> if we want to gather information throughout the organization on, say, performance of that uh, of that product or uh, market share or pricing, we have a way of connecting those different things together. We have one ontology that we did for a life sciences firm that talked about all of uh, taking a generic compound and then all of the different brand names internationally and US and then all the formulations. So if you wanted to get, say, the average pricing for a, a compound, you had to know all those things. You had to know what it was called in those different markets and those different regions and then you have to understand what those uh, what those sales volume is. So the point here of the ontology in that context is to understand you know market share and uh, revenue and pricing because you have to map all those things together. <clears throat> in any kind of an organization, we have those uh, types of relationships. So we may have products and we have services. We have services that go with that product. When we have problems, we have solutions, and here's the solution to that problem, right? Um, everything is related conceptually. Anything you can think of that's related conceptually can be in your ontology. And so that's when you get, um, you know, you play the, the, the game of six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon with IMDB, the database, and you say, okay, the movies that Kevin Bacon has been in, what are the other actors that have been in those movies? And now let's find a connection between that actor and another actor and a movie that Kevin Bacon is in. But that's an ontological relationship. It's an ontological structure. You can think of it as all the sets of organizing principles to describe that domain of knowledge and the relationships between them. And this is where you start to say, what is that thing? How do we define it? That is the knowledge infrastructure. That is the knowledge scaffolding of the organization. It's all the buckets in which we can place our information and our content. Um, you could say it's a chart of accounts for knowledge. I once, um, we did a work, a project that's in the book for Applied Materials many years ago. And the CFO uh, said, or a senior finance person said, well, why do we need, you know, ontologies and taxonomies? Why don't we just get Google? And they said, well, do you have a chart of accounts for your finance organization? He said, of course I do. I said, well, why don't you get rid of your chart of accounts and just get Google? You know, because a chart of accounts, <laughs> because a taxonomy is a chart of accounts for knowledge. And again, in the case of applied materials, that was, you know, fabrication plants and equipment types and <clears throat> uh, fabrication techniques and regions. I'm just making these up right now, but there are about 30 different sets of organizing principles that describe the knowledge of that enterprise. And once we had those relationships, it was much easier to go in and say, use a part number to find all the conversations about problems with that part or that maintenance, to uh, enter in uh, a, an image and find out what that image was, what type of part, what type of assembly, what type of sub-assembly, how it was used, what the level of inventory uh, in stock was based on the ERP integration. So the ontology gives you this mechanism to traverse the knowledge and information and data of the organization. <clears throat> and we do it that way when we have that ontology, which think of that as that structure, that knowledge scaffolding, then we have the data and we can access the data. That's actually a knowledge graph, right? Graph data consists of the ontology and an access mechanism to the data. Now, so what that does is it allows you to do faster reporting, to find relationships that uh, were not readily available to do uh, information queries that were not anticipated. It allows you to uh, leverage lots of different data sources that may have different descriptors because you're mapping those together. It really gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility, agility, extensibility when you build these things correctly. And correctly means, you know, looking at uh, the different dimensions of your information. Right? So we're doing project project right now for financial services on the content side. And essentially, we need to understand all the different types of thought leadership and all of the different themes within that thought leadership and the topics, and then the experts who produce that, and then the audiences for that, and then 
all of those relationships allow the ability to go in, do a search for a concept, and then use that concept as a jumping off point to get to other concepts and other information. You might hear a little bit of background noise. Both of my cats decided that they were going to uh, help today with the uh, uh, webinar, but uh, they haven't come by yet. They're, they're making well, mis- it's, I'll just point, it's not an official uh, internet event until a cat shows up. So thanks for <laughs> that today. They should show themselves. They should make some noise. That's right. <laughs> hey, Seth, you just said that was, there's so much in everything you just said. There are two things I want to uh, come back to. Well, one is that you mentioned um, part of the process of building ontology is what is that thing that you're talking about? And Google famously described when they introduced their knowledge graph, this notion of yeah. things, not strings and the importance. And, and I think, I think a lot of content people are still strings. People we're still thinking about the content, the, the, mm. the you know, the strings of characters that make up content, right. but you're talking about things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Distinction? Sure. Sure. So when you think about, um, a piece of information, you kind of have to say, well, what is it? What's what's the isness? We were actually just awarded a patent for one of our approaches for leveraging ontologies and chatbots. Cool. And then all these offers for like plaques and things like that. And I'm like, okay, so what is this? This thing is a brochure. What is it about? It is about a, uh, uh, a, um, uh, a an award for a patent, right? So the isness is a brochure. Well, how do I tell a thousand of these brochures apart, a thousand of these things apart? I do that with aboutness. The isness is brochure. The aboutness is <clears throat> patent award, right? <clears throat> so we can take anything like that. This is a book. It is about, you know, information management. Is it about? It is about AI. It is about ontologies. Um, if we have a contract and we have a thousand contracts that we have to set up, tell apart. You know, this is how do we tell them apart? We tell them apart by contract type, by customer name, by uh, region, by all sorts of descriptors. And those descriptors become the aboutness. So, when we business and aboutness, that's describing the entities and the objects. And then within those entities and objects, we need to define all those organizing principles. Now, <clears throat> people could say, well, doesn't that sound like master data? Well, isn't that just content architecture? And so why don't we just start there? And my answer to that is it's not exactly the same because if you start at the master data level, you're driving right into the data. You're saying, okay, this is an organizing principle. It's a data field or it's a value within the field. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but you can, there's cats running about. So they haven't made their appearance yet, but they're, they're making themselves no, well, they have to come on the air at some point. Uh, I they got it. I got to. I got to. You got to see them, but they're you know they're t- they're they're busy torturing each other. Maybe if I get a laser pointer. Nice. Yeah. Hey, we anyway. go back. One thing. One thing I want to interject real quickly. When you talk about aboutness, um, yeah. is that the? Ex- that sounds like metadata. Is that? I mean, uh, yes. that's the term that most of my folks are familiar with. Yeah, it is metadata. But let me give you another example. Okay. Yeah. Let me give you another example. The reason why we don't want to start with metadata or, or, uh, or just taxonomy or just master data, right? The reason we want to start at that level is we want to start at the conceptual level. What's important to the business? And then where does that show up? Where does that concept show up? So concept can show up in lots of different ways. Like a lot of people used to think that taxonomy was the same as navigation, Right, they'd say, "Oh, we got to build the taxonomy." You think of a hierarchy, and that was a navigational hierarchy. But it's much more than that, because if you think about um, something, a collaboration technology like uh, SharePoint. I know everybody's into Teams, but SharePoint is a good example because if you had some, uh, if you're a consulting firm like us, we have methodologies, right? And a lot of firms have methodology, manufacturing methodologies, consulting methodologies, you know, problem solution methodologies, troubleshooting method, whatever. And the, and the issue is the methodology is a concept. And so you could, you could, in SharePoint, have a whole site collection called methodology. And within that, there could be other sites about different types of methodology. <clears throat> you could also have, I hope you can take those out in post-production, <laughs> my coughs. Uh, the, uh, and then you have the uh, <clears throat> site itself, which could be called methodology. And within that, there could be libraries. You can have a library called methodology. And with them in that, you could have 
uh, artifacts. You could have a list within the library called methodology. You could have a content type called methodology. You could have a metadata field called meta methodology, or you could have a term within the met metadata field as a control vocabulary item called methodology. So methodology as a concept needs to be translated into lots of different structures that are neither, that are not just navigation and not just classification. They can be workflows, <clears throat> they can be other organizing principles, they can be uh, bigger constructs, they can be processes, right? So there's a lot of stuff, and that's the cat trying to make some background. Uh, we'll cut that, we'll take that out in post-production too. Um, <clears throat> but the point here is that starting at that data level actually loses a lot of that context. Context. So what we want to do is start with concepts and then decide what those important concepts get agreement on those and then start thinking about how those get designed into multiple downstream systems within your infrastructure. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And, you know, one thing as you talk and hearkening back to something you said earlier, I think I gather that much of a lot of your work has been in uh, technical communication. You mentioned earlier componentized content and things like that. Mm -hmm. And in that world, like the DITA world, there's the notion of topics and then in the ontological world, there's the notion of concepts. Do those, how do those stitch together? Well, you know, it's interesting. We did a, um, a webinar recently about building componentized content for um, chatbots to power chatbots. And topics uh, and tasks fit very well into that because you can actually uh, have a mapping of topics to uh, the organizing principles that are important for your chatbot. Uh, without getting into too much detail, the answer is it's incredibly important and topics do map into taxonomic structures, right? And we have other types of identifiers and we have other types of metadata get, that gets surfaced. And again, one of the um, webinars that we did, we, we did a deep dive into that around, um, again, componentizing content and then automatically ingesting that into a chatbot. But you still have to think about the additional metadata around topics, because a topic in and of itself can have additional descriptors, right? Because a topic can also have, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, product that's in, that it's associated with. Uh, maybe there's a troubleshooting code. Maybe there's there can be other metadata associated with that. To retrieve that topic in the right context, usually it's in a it's already in a hierarchy, but you want to be able to retrieve that topic uh, uh, separately and out of the context of the hierarchy. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, um, and that I think, and what you just said also reminds me of other of another big concept that's in the air these days. This notion of mm -hmm. decoupledness, like separating, mm -hmm. you know, even and it's so meta because it applies at every level here. It's like separating concepts from topics, from things and strings, and and even like the um, the individual details in all the implementation of this. Is is that decoupledness? Is that like even metadata? to identify what a concept is and help you stitch it back to some other concept. It, um, it, it seems like a lot of this, and, and the way, you, and the other thing you've said is about how um, this spans, not like just content, you know, because that's what my folks are most concerned about, but also the way you just effortlessly integrate all of that with like business uh, objectives and metrics and analytics and and business goals and, and domain knowledge and all that stuff. Um, it, Tell me a little bit more about how, how an ontology, you know, a little bit more into the mechanics of how the ontology stitches all that together in a way that helps you get better, create and manage better content. Yeah, well, um, it, it, it does get a little bit into the weeds uh, and it's a little bit hard to explain without diagrams and, mm -hmm. and book charts and so on. But, um, but at the end of the day, you know, you want to think about a, a piece of, of knowledge or piece of information <clears throat> not only in the context of um, the overall structure of a document so that you can, you know, shuffle in and out pieces to do translations and updates and so on, but you also want to think about the identifiers and the handles of that content so that you can pull it out <clears throat> into another context, right? There should be enough descriptors on that piece of, uh, on that component so that I can say, okay, this component uh, can answer this particular question, right? People don't want, <clears throat> you know, when we were doing work for a large insurance company in their call center, um, basically they did not want, you know, when they did a search on anesthesia claims, they get 100 results. 
And one of those results would be a 300 page document, right? So the retrieval of that, you didn't want that 300 page document. You wanted to understand how to process that anesthesia claim. So you needed to know, well, what type of anesthesia claim that was and what the coverage principles were. And that was a little piece of content. That was a small paragraph, right? So we need to think about the granularity of the context of that paragraph and be able to structure the metadata around that. Now, again, <clears throat> Darwin information typing architecture data is extensible. It's adaptable. You evolve it. That's why it's called Darwin information typing, because you can adapt it. So you can build custom metadata around that for audience, for um, task, for, for uh, uh, troubleshooting code, for you know, product or whatever. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, let's give this piece of this component enough of the identifiers that we understand its context and the task it's supporting and the problem it's uh, supporting or the solution it's supporting and be able to pull that out with an, with, uh, by identifying an utterance and the intent from that utterance. And think about it, you know, when you, when you work with uh, virtual assistants, in chatbots, what you're trying to do is take phrase variations of how people would describe their problem, and you're trying to classify that to an intent, right? Utterances are like, you know, geez, I can't, uh, my, my password isn't working, and or my, uh, my, my ID is locked out, or I forgot my password, or my computer's mad at me. I've actually did a workshop, and I said, can't think of all the different ways you can phrase, I can't get in my computer, you know? And it was crazy. All those variances, all those different utterances boiled down to an intent of change my password. But it's much more complex than that because intents are multidimensional, right? We don't want to just, if you just try to classify an utterance to a single thing, you end up with like a pre-coordinated taxonomy. You're saying, well, what does this thing mean? Well, it means this one thing. Well, it means more than one thing. Because if I say I need uh, claims uh, coverage, uh, um, uh, uh, I need coverage of uh, 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 conditions for a, uh, a type of business, a uh, an employment agency in Massachusetts covering liability for employee actions, right? There's about four different entities in there. There's a type of business, there's a type of claim, there's a type of coverage, uh, there's a state, right? And all of those become facets in which you can retrieve that very specific piece of content. So that's how we think, need to think about component authoring, not just the context of that document for translation and localization, but the context of that document for standalone retrieval in the context of a specific problem that you can describe across multiple dimensions, that you can describe in a way that gets you zeroed into that specific piece of content out of that ocean of information, all of these content objects. Right now, the old days, it was monolithic documents. You need to have to tag across multiple dimensions. Well, that doesn't work, right? I don't want a 50-page document. I don't want a 100-page manual. The saying is TL didn't, uh, DR, right? Too long didn't read, <laughs> right? You, people say RTFM, read the friggin' manual, and people's response is TLDR, you know, too long didn't read. <laughs> RTFM, TLDR. And so you got to keep those two things in mind and say, what is exactly that information I need to get to this user in this context for this purpose? That is what is good about AI-driven content. Like you get organizations that are starting to say, oh, we have an AI content group. Well, no, it should just be a content group. It's not AI content. But what is valuable about that is the fact that they're thinking very specifically about the user, the use case, the task, and the context, and building that just that one piece of content to answer that question. Now, uh, I was trying to up, uh, to uh, activate a, a credit card and I pulled off the sticker and threw it away before I did it. And I thought I'd find it someplace else. Or, and I'm looking and looking and looking. I'm getting pages and pages and pages of content about credit card activation and all this nonsense about it, all about credit card this and credit card that and how we're protected and how the how do I activate the freaking thing? Like, where's the number for that? I could not find it. And 10 pages of content. And I find I forgot where I found it, but it was like horrendously difficult. I searched for activation. I searched for, you know, uh, you know, I forgot what I searched. I did all sorts of searches and I couldn't get that number to activate my credit card. Now, what is the purpose of all that other content that is associated with credit card activation if it doesn't tell me how to do that? 
That is the value of AI power of AI driven content because we're trying to take a bot. We're trying to use that bot for a very specific audience, a specific set of use cases. Mm -hmm. So that's where we need to think about content in a much more precise way. Yeah, the way that that whole series you just set out that that uh, alignment of the user, the use case, the task, and the content that sort of gets at like what you were just talking about the specific example of chatbots, but also generically any kind of personalization yeah. delivering absolutely. personalized content absolutely yeah and, and it's no different <clears throat> it's no different like when you think about personalization and you think about a chatbot they're the same mechanism right you're taking a signal and the signal in the case of a chatbot is an utterance you're interpreting that and you're responding you're predicting the answer you're making mm -hmm. a prediction. You're personalizing right you're saying it's a signal and a response and the richer the signal the more details about the user that i have understanding their use case their persona their task, their objective, I can be, I can uh, predict the content that they need. Well, that doesn't matter whether it's on a web page, because I'm getting signals, I'm getting their digital body language, I know who they are. I, uh, if they're authenticated, know something about what they have. That's why first party data is so important. I collect those attributes and those identifiers and that data and that digital uh, exhaust from all those other systems that they interact with. I consolidate with a custom data platform, and I use that to inform the content, the products, the next best offer, the next best action for that user in that context. That does that. That can be the same thing as answering a question, right? If they're doing a search, if they're navigating, if they're downloading a white paper, if they're looking at certain products, those are all signals. And then I want to respond to those signals. Those signals are metadata. Right? And we respond by reading that metadata and it's aligning that metadata with the content, with metadata on our content. Right, So it's a matter of processing those signals and aligning those with the content. Now, there's also um, there's work that um, we had done for a large uh, global technology firm. They handle over 10 million knowledge transactions per day. In other words, they're, they're answering questions. They're serving content once. Uh, pu I'm sorry, publishing content once, consuming it everywhere. They are very advanced with component offering. We've been doing this about 10 years based on work that we started with them uh, almost a decade ago. And they said they have operationalized this and they do this without armies and armies of content creators and content managers, website managers. And they have saved hundreds of millions of dollars per year on content operations by doing this. This also sets them up perfectly for being able to build cognitive assistance, high functionality cognitive assistance. Those cognitive assistants are going to be the way organizations do their business. There's no other way because as we look at lower, um, we, we are, you know, we're constantly reducing costs and we're trying to provide better levels of customer service. <clears throat> we can't afford to scale the human expertise. We have to capture, codify, automate, right? That's just what's going to happen in the chapter in my book where I talk about Alan Perkins and how he goes about his day interacting with virtual assistants all day, every day, that's what our world will be, right? And they're going to be conversational and they're going to work really well. Right now they suck. Between where we are today, where they are really bad and where we'll be, we know in the next several years, that's the world. The world will be a world of conversational assistants and intelligent virtual assistants that are very much... Uh, uh, analogous to talking to people. They're not going to be the same. They're not going to think, but they will model that. They will replicate that. They will synthesize that. They will simulate that. And uh, there's got to be a human in the loop, but the place the, but, but to, but between where we are today <clears throat> and where that future will be in just a few years, and it's going to accelerate, is going to make some organizations obsolete, just like the dot-com boom and, and the internet vaporized, it's my favorite term around that, by a book by, um, <clears throat> by a colleague of mine, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, called Vaporized, which uh, talked about uh, how the internet has mm -hmm. bought up all these organizations. You see the same thing with cognitive assistance, right? Because you won't be able to afford all those humans and those highly trained humans. And a lot of the expertise is aging out of the workforce. You don't get people coming up as field engineers and you know, factory maintenance guys and factory engineers and production engineers over 30 years, that, that knowledge is not being created in the ranks. And so organizations are going to face this, they're going to have this deluge of need, a tsunami of need around knowledge architecture, knowledge codification, knowledge capture, componentization, so that we can power these tools. 
And that is why component authoring and content is so critical in thinking about this in that ontological framework, that ontological construct. So in the future, you know, we're going to have that, that capability and the companies that don't have it and the ones that are not starting today or not don't have a handle on it or the knowledge is out of control, they haven't even thought about it, it's not on their radar, they are going to be flat-footed and they are going to be severely dis- still motor on because the size and you know market reach and distribution channels and brand strength, but they'll erode. They're going to erode. Their costs are going to go up. Their revenue is going to go down and eventually they'll go away. And there'll be lower cost, more agile, born digital producers who understand these principles and apply them and implement and operationalize and execute just like this large um, global organization. And boy, I almost saying their name. We got to cut that right out. <laughs> no, I will. I, hey, Seth, I can't believe this. We're already coming up on time. And I, there's, you've said three things in the last five minutes that one, I wanted to do a whole other episode about. But is there anything last today? Is there anything, a uh, little last little quick tidbit you'd like to leave the listeners with before we wrap up? Well, you know, it's, it's a journey. I think uh, if you're not on this journey, you got to start. If your clients or organizations you work for don't understand this stuff, invite me in to do executive briefings. I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> it's really important to get this message across to the C-suite. It's really important to get this message to leadership because it is going to be existential. And it's a, there's a duty uh, that the people on this, on this um, webcast, this podcast, have as experts, as professionals in this industry. You have a duty to get this on the radar of your leadership. It's not a matter of don't be timid. You know, you got to be aggressive. You got to say, look, this is important. And if they don't understand it, find the things that they need to, to see and learn and read and hear to make them understand it. Because, you know, the people on this call are going to have jobs, <laughs> right? The executives that don't take this seriously will not have jobs. And I have seen it. I have seen it multiple times. I've seen it happen where, you know, organizations did not. I, I have a story about a publisher that lost their entire K through 12 uh uh, textbook market because we're another competitor using componentized content. And guess what? That was like 10 years ago. Okay. And the publisher had to get there. They couldn't get there in time. They lost that market. That's going to happen over and over and over again in the industries that we see today as these tools accelerate and component content and content management is more critical than ever. And taxonomy and information architecture, despite people saying, You don't need it. AI will take care of it. That is the farthest thing from the truth. Read my article. There's no AI without IA. You do a search for that and uh, and find it. Of course, buy my book and read that too. (laughs) No, I'll link that. I'll link to both of those in the show notes. Hey, one very last thing, Seth. What's the best way for folks to stay in touch to follow you on social media or online? Oh, sure. So um, you can go to the website and subscribe to a newsletter at www.early. Now, don't forget the E before the Y, -Y E-A-R-L-E-Y.com. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Seth Early, S-E-T-H-E-A-R-L-E-Y. And I'm also on Twitter, at Seth Early. So just uh, first name, last name. And my email is Seth at Early.com. So just my first name, at last name. Just don't forget the email. The y. Gotcha. And I have a podcast called Early AI, E-A-R-L-E-Y. We have some great guests from uh, the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And um, that's a great show that I do with Chris uh, Featherstall. And so that's another place to uh, check. Yeah, I lo- I've listened to several episodes. I love that. love that podcast. Well, thanks so much, Seth. Yeah. Really enjoyed the Thank conversation. You. Thank you for having me. And apologies uh, that the, the kitties made noise but didn't show their faces. <laughs> no, we love the cat, our cats on the yeah. internet. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Take Seth. care. <laughs> okay, bye now. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.